Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining me for story time with Sue on this beautiful Friday. If you're in the Newton, Massachusetts area, you'll know that we are having just a gorgeous day today. So I decided to um, tell you some stories from outside today. So I hope you're having a, a nice day. It's Memorial Day weekend, so hopefully you have a three-day weekend coming up to enjoy the beautiful springtime. Today I thought I'd read to you some classic stories that I really like that have an environmental focus. You've probably heard of all three of these, but hopefully you'll enjoy them just the same. So let's get started. First story I'm going to read to you today is Blueberries for Sal by Robert McCloskey. This is a very old book and a really special one. On the front it has a sticker that says children's favorite for 50 years. Let's look inside and see when this book is copywritten. If you look inside the front cover, usually on the back of the first page, you'll see this. And this is all the information about the book and how it's cataloged in the Library of Congress, what its uh, international standard book number is. These numbers have to do with how many editions have been printed. And right here, you'll see copyright 1948 by Robert McCloskey. So this book was first copyrighted in 1948. That's a really old book. So inside the cover, the frontispages pages are really nice. They show what the story is gonna be about a little bit. I really like the illustrations in this book as well. So let's get started. One day, little Sal went with her mother to Blueberry Hill to pick blueberries. Little Sal brought along her small tin pail and her mother brought her large tin pail to put blueberries in. We will take our blueberries home and can them, said her mother. Then we will have food for the winter. Little Sal picked three berries and dropped them in her little tin pail. Kaplink, kaplink, kaplunk. She picked three more berries and ate them. Then she picked more berries and dropped one in the pail. Kaplunk, and the rest she ate. Then Little Sal ate all four blueberries out of her pail. Doesn't sound like she's saving very many, does it? Her mother walked slowly through the bushes picking blueberries as she went and putting them in her pail. Little Sal struggled along behind, picking blueberries and eating every single one. Little Sal hurried ahead and dropped a blueberry in her mother's pail. It didn't sound kaplink because the bottom of the pail was already covered with berries. She reached down inside to get her berry back. Though she really didn't mean to, she pulled out a large handful because there were so many blueberries right up close to the one she had put in. Her mother stopped picking and said, Now, Sal, you run along and pick your own berries. Mother wants to take her berries home and can them for next winter. Her mother went back to her picking, but little Sal, because her feet were tired of standing and walking, sat down in the middle of a large clump of bushes and ate blueberries. Look how cute she is. On the other side of Blueberry Hill, Little Bear came with his mother to eat blueberries. Little Bear, she said, eat lots of berries and grow big and fat. We must store up food for the long cold winter. Little Bear followed behind his mother as she walked slowly through the bushes eating berries. 
Little Bear stopped now and then to eat berries. Then he had to hustle to catch up. Because his feet were tired of hustling, he picked out a large clump of bushes and sat down right in the middle and ate blueberries. Over on the other side of the hill, little Sal ate all of the berries she could reach from where she was sitting. Then she started out to find her mother. She heard a noise from around a rock and thought, that is my mother walking along. But it was a mother crow and her children, and they stopped eating berries and flew away, saying, Caw, caw, caw. Then she heard another noise in the bushes and thought, That is surely my mother, and I will go that way. But it was little bear's mother instead. She was tramping along, eating berries, and thinking about storing up food for the winter. Little Sal tramped right along behind. By this time, Little Bear had eaten all the berries he could reach without moving from his clump of bushes. Then he hustled off to catch up with his mother. He hunted and hunted, but his mother was nowhere to be seen. He heard a noise from over a stump and thought, That is my mother walking along. It was a mother partridge and her children. They stopped eating berries and hurried away. Then he heard a noise in the bushes and thought, that is surely my mother. I will hustle that way. But it was little Sal's mother instead. She was walking along, picking berries and thinking about canning them for next winter. Little Bear hustled right along behind her. Little Bear and Little Sal's mother and Little Sal and Little Bear's mother were all mixed up with each other among the blueberries on Blueberry Hill. Little Bear's mother heard Sal walking along behind her and thought it was Little Bear. And she said, Little Bear, munch, munch, eat all you, gulp, can possibly hold, swallow. Little Sal said nothing. She picked three berries and dropped them. Kaplink, kaplank, kaplunk in her small tin pail. Little Bear's mother turned around to see what on earth could make a noise like kaplunk. Garumph, she cried, choking on a mouthful of berries. This is not my child. Where is Little Bear? She took one good look and backed away. She was old enough to be shy of people, even a very small person like Little Sal. Then she turned around and walked off very fast to hunt for Little Bear. Little Sal's mother heard Little Bear tramping along behind and thought it was Little Sal. She kept right on picking and thinking about canning blueberries for next winter. Little Bear padded up and peeked into her pail. Of course, he only wanted to taste a few of what was inside, but there were so many and they were so close together that he tasted a tremendous mouthful by mistake. Now, Sal, Sal's mother, without turning around, you run along and pick your own berries. Mother wants to can these for next winter. Little Bear tasted another tremendous mouthful and almost spilled the entire pail of blueberries. Little Sal's mother turned around and gasped, My goodness, you are not Little Sal. Where, oh, where is my child? Little Bear just sat munching and munching and swallowing and licking his lips. Little Sal's mother slowly backed away. She was old enough to be shy of bears, even very small bears like Little Bear. Then she turned and walked away quickly to look for Little Sal.
She hadn't gone very far before she heard a kaplink, kaplink, kaplunk. She knew just what made that kind of noise. Little Bear's mother had not hunted very long before she heard a hustling sound that stopped now and then to munch and swallow. She knew just what made that kind of a noise. Ah, she found her baby. Little Bear and his mother went home down one side of Blueberry Hill, eating blueberries all the way, and full of food stored up for next winter. And Little Sal and her mother went down the other side of Blueberry Hill, picking berries all the way, and drove home with food to can for next winter, a whole pail of blueberries and three more besides. The end. And here you can see them canning. This is what canning is, when you preserve food and store it up for another time. And here they are. They're using their stove to heat up the blueberries. They're adding sugar. They're pouring it into these special jars that they can seal. So they'll have it for later. There's the little bear eating his blueberries. I hope you like that story. So this weekend I'm going to start planting my garden. It's finally warm enough to put my seedlings outside that I got from Newton Community Farm. I'll show you a few things I'm going to plant to grow food for my family. First we have a plant that probably most of you know all about. These are tomato seedlings. The type of seedling I have here, which is called the variety, is sun gold. They're cherry tomatoes. They're little tiny tomatoes. They're about this big and they're super sweet and they're orangish yellow once they once they mature and make fruit. Another thing I'm going to plant in my garden are two different types of peppers. Shishito peppers, which are not too hot and are sort of a light green yellowish color. And then these peppers, red cherry peppers, these are going to be super spicy and round and red. Another type of food that we like to eat a lot of at my house is basil. So I've got some basil seedlings here. There's six little seedlings. You can see their stems. I'll probably put these in a pot or two. They like lots of sun, and I like to keep them away from the ground because sometimes the squirrels in my yard like to bother them. And something I'm going to try growing for the first time this year is fennel. You might have tried fennel before, or you might not have. It's got a very strong flavor. It's really good raw in salads. That's how I like to eat it. So I've got quite a few here, so I'm going to spread them out and try them in different places around my yard and see if they'll grow. I think they're really pretty, and they almost look like carrots on the top, but they're not. Then the last thing I'll show you are some flowers that I'm going to plant in pots and in my front yard. I can't plant them in my backyard because my dog will dig them out. But these are great for attracting bees, which help pollinate my crop in my garden. I've got some marigolds here. This variety is called Durango Outback, and I like these because all different colors, all different kinds, many different types of marigolds. And bees really like marigolds. We grow a lot of them at the farm. I also have something called straw flower, which is hard to imagine right now, but it makes a really neat bristly little flower that's good to dry out and put in flower arrangements. The last one I have is called Centauria or Florist Blue Boy. And these look almost like asters. They make a beautiful blue flower. So we'll check in on my garden later on and see how it's going next time. I did want to tell you that next week we'll have story time live from the farm. I'm going to be over at the farm next Friday. So I'm going to take my camera with me and we'll have story time right at the farm. So I'll be able to show you. Um, the view of the farm from where I'm sitting next Friday at 1 o'clock. 
The next book I'm going to read to you is called The Lorax. This is one of my favorite books of all times. I find it very inspiring to help you figure out why you should care about the earth and the environment. It's a wonderful story, it's a classic, and it's by Dr. Seuss, who's always very funny and sort of tongue twistery to read, but I'll do my best. Gotta get everything set up. Every book is a different size. The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. Also, the colors are very vivid, which is fun to look at, too. In this book, we can look inside the title page, just like we did on the last book, and see that this book was copywritten. Let's see. The copyright was renewed in 1999, but it was written long, long before that. It looks like 1971. At the far end of town where the brickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing except old crows is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the brickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax and why was it there? And why was it lifted? Oops. <laughs> Sorry, let me come back. We had a big wind gust up there. <laughs> Let's try that part again. Why was it lifted and taken somewhere from the far end of town where the grickle grass grows? The old onceler still lives there. Ask him, he knows. You won't see the onceler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkum on top of his store. He lurks in his lurkum, cold under the roof, where he makes his own clothes out of miff muffered moof. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail and the shell of the great, great, great grandfather snail. Then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you've paid him away in his snub, his secret strange hole in his grovulous glove. Then he grunts, I will call you by whisper my phone, for the secrets I tell are for your ears alone. Slop, down slops the whisper from a phone to your ear, and the old onceler's whispers are not very clear, since they have to come down through a snurgly hose, and he sounds as if he's had smallish bees up his nose. Now I'll tell you, he says, with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It all started way back, such a long, long time back. Way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the swami swans rang out in space, one morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the trufala trees, the bright colored tufts of the trufala trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees, I saw brown barbalutes frisking about in their barbalute suits as they played in the shade and ate trufula fruits. From the ripulous pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around.
But those trees, those trees, those trufala trees, all my life I'd been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk, and they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what I'd do. I unloaded my cart. In no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a trufala tree with one chop. And with great skillful skill and with great speedy speed, I took the soft tuft and I knitted a sneed. The instant I'd finished, I heard a gazump. I looked. I saw something pop out of the stump of the tree I'd chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him. That's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish and brownish and mossy, and he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset as he shouted and puffed. What's that thing you've made out of my truffula tuft? Look, Lorax, I said, there's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I am doing no harm. I'm being quite useful. This thing is a thneed. A thneed finds something that all people need. It's a shirt. It's a sock. It's a glove. It's a hat. But it has other uses. Yes, far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers, for bicycle seats. The Lorax said, Sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on earth who would buy that fool sneed. But the very next minute, I proved he was wrong. For just at that minute, a chap came along, and he thought that the sneed I had knitted was great. He happily bought it for three ninety eight. I laughed at the Lorax. You poor stupid guy. You never can tell what some people will buy. I repeat, cried the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up, if you please. I rushed across the room and in no time at all built a radio phone. I put in a quick call. I called my brothers and uncles and aunts. And I said, listen here, here's a wonderful chance for the whole Wunzler family to get mighty rich. Get over here fast. Take the road to North Niche. Turn left at Weehawken, sharp right at South Stitch. And in no time at all, in the factory I built, the whole Wunzler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting sneeds, just as busy as bees to the sound of the chopping of truffula trees. Then, oh baby, oh, how my business did grow. Now chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I quickly invented my super axe hacker, which whacked off four truffula trees at one smacker. We were making sneeds four times as fast as before, and that Lorax, he didn't show up anymore. But the next week, he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I'm the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbaloots who played in the shade in their barbaloot suits and happily lived eating truffula fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough truffula fruit to go round. And my poor barbaloots are all getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. They loved living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food, and I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried, and he sent them away. 
I, the onceler, felt sad as they watched them all go. But business is business, and business must grow, regardless of crummies and tummies, you know. I meant no harm, I most truly did not, but I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my fa factory, I biggered my roads, I biggered my wagons, I biggered the loads of the fleas I shipped out. I was shipping them forth to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on biggering, selling more fleas, and I biggered my money, which everyone needs. Then again he came back. I was fixing some pipes when that old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. I am the Lorax, he coughed and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffled, he snargled, he sniffed. Onceler, he cried with a crefulous croak. Onceler, you're making such smogulous smoke. My poor swami swans, why they can't sing a note? No one can sing a smog in his throat. And so, said the Lorax, please pardon my cough. They cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog. You smogged up around here. What's more, snapped the Lorax. His dander was up. Let me say a few words about gloppity glop. Your machinery chugs on day and night without stop, making gloppity glop also schloppity schlop. And what do you do with this leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old onceler man, you. You're glumping the pond where the humming fish hum. No more can they hum, for their gills are all gummed. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax. Now listen here, Dad. All you do is yap, yap, and say bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to go on doing just what I do. And for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering and biggering, turning more trufla trees into sneeds, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an ax on a tree, then we heard the tree fall, the very last trufula tree of them all. No more trees, no more sneeds, no more work to be done. So in no time, my uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars and drove away under the smog smuggered stars. Now all that was left neath the bad smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax and I. The Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess. That was long, long ago, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away. 
Through the years, while my buildings have fallen apart, I've worried about it with all of my heart. But now, says the Wensler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch, calls the ones. You see? He lets something fall. It's a truffula seed. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffula seeds, and truffula trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffula, treat it with care, give it clean water, and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. The end. So maybe that will help give you some ideas of some things you can do outside this weekend to help the environment. Can you plant a tree or a flower? Can you water something? Can you take good care of animals? Are you able to go for a nature hike with your family? Can you save some seeds? Can you pull some weeds so that some other plants can grow? There's all kinds of things you can think of to do in your own yard or in your own neighborhood or at the park. The last book I'm going to read to you is one called Slowly, 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 Said the Sloth. And this is by Eric Carle. We read another book that he wrote, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, a few weeks ago. You can hear my neighbor's dog barking in the background. I think he can hear me up here. He wonders what I'm doing in the backyard. I like to read this book very slowly since the sloth moves very slowly. Right now is sort of a slow time in our lives. So I think this is an appropriate book for today, and I hope you like it. The colors are really nice, too. Let me tilt this down a little bit. How's that? Oh, that looks good. Oh. Here's Eric Carl visiting with Jane Goodall. It's a nice story about sloths and why Eric Carl chose to write about them. Look at all the pretty colors. Slowly, 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 a sloth crawled along a branch of a tree. Slowly, 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 the sloth ate a leaf. Slowly, 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 the sloth fell asleep. Slowly, 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 the sloth woke up. All day long, the sloth hung upside down in the tree. All night long, the sloth hung upside down in the tree. Even when it rained, the sloth hung upside down in the tree. Why are you so slow? The howler monkey asked one day, but the sloth didn't answer. Why are you so quiet? 
they came and asked. But the sloth didn't answer. Why are you so boring? The anteater asked. But the sloth didn't answer. Tell me, said the jaguar, why are you so lazy? The sloth thought and thought and thought for a long, long time. Finally, the sloth replied, It is true that I am slow, quiet, and boring. I am lackadaisical, I dawdle, and I dilly-dally. I am also unflappable, languid, stoic, impassive, sluggish, lethargic, placid, calm, mellow, laid back, and well, slothful. I am relaxed and tranquil, and I like to live in peace, but I am not lazy. Then the sloth yawned and said, that's just how I am. I like to do things slowly, slowly, slowly. The end. And in the back, Eric Carle introduces you to quite a few different animals, many of which we don't have around here and might be interesting to learn more about. For example, there's a spider monkey in this book. Uh, there's a poison dart frog. An anaconda, which is a kind of snake. Mm, what else? A howler monkey. A toucan. Armadillo, a lot of different animals, and some beautiful butterflies on the last page. So you learn a little bit about the Amazon rainforest in this book. So those are all the stories that I have for you today. I hope that you have a relaxed, tranquil weekend like a sloth. I hope that you're able to get outside and do some things to experience nature and protect the earth if you can, like the Lorax. And I hope that you get to have some delicious, healthy, fresh food like Sal and her mom in blueberries for Sal. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'll see you next Friday at 1 o'clock when we have story time live from Newton Community Farm. Take care. Have a nice weekend. Bye.